Remember, I had these pictures just to help you recall. Um, we wanted to classify these apples, and the weak learners were these um, decision stumps. And you always updated your distribution by putting more weight on the hard examples. And it was an iterative procedure. And at the end, you output a, a linear combination of the stumps that you got. So what I'm going to do now is explain boosting in terms of game theory and various other, other ways. OK? So. Source select lab computer center screen. No. I want it both on this. They switched, right? Okay. Source select. Okay. So. So I'm going to do a game theory interpretation as well, and talk about various other interpretations and visualize things. Uh, this I, I'm quite impressed. There's a lot of visualization uh, in this summer school. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. I do not know how Euler. Gauss, how, how they did math. I mean, they must have been, I mean, I cannot live without visualization. So in particular, I'm going to give, at first I'm going to talk about what is the objective of boosting, right? And uh, without regularization. And um, give a game theory interpretation, column generation interpretation, and then uh, linear programming interpretation and visualize these things a little bit. OK, so remember, we were in this following situation. We wanted to classify apples. Those were our examples, right? Um, and uh, then per apple, we had a label classification. And then we had a weak learner, which had these classifications. Then we multiply the two. We do this in the support vector machines as well. You multiply the, the label times the instance, and then you get the u vector. And that's what's going to be in our matrices. That's what you're going to work with. In other words, you sort of, by multiplying in the labels, you, only, you can assume all the labels are plus 1. That's another way of viewing it. Okay. In general, what does this u mean? It measures the accuracy of a particular example. Perfect means these two agree, you have plus 1. Opposite is minus 1. And you also let h to be between 0 and 1. I usually don't put it in the example because it's confusing. But then you also would have a neutral accuracy. OK, good. So now I have to define what I mean by the edge again more precisely. I did it in the first lecture informally. Um, OK, look here. This was the accuracy of an example. Now we also have, a, so it was plus 1 if you were classified correct, minus 1 if you're opposite. OK, so plus means good, right? Um, and uh, we also had a weighting on the example. So the weighted average, weighted accuracy, that's what I call the edge. This is called the edge, the weighted accuracy. Clear? And the margin of an example, you gain, start with the accuracy of an example, but then you sh now you sum over the weights of the hypotheses. In other words, here the n is fixed, the example is fixed, and here the t is fixed. So that's why this is an edge, and this is something per example, and this is going to be a margin. Okay, it's the weighted accuracy of the example. Later on, we're going to put the u's in a matrix, and in one time, you sum along the row, and the other one along a column with different weights. This will become apparent in a moment. So, so this is going to be our fundamental notion. Unfortunately, there's two, because there's two sets of weights, weights on the examples and weights on the hypotheses. Can't get away with it without that, because there's duality and so forth. And I hope to visualize some of this duality stuff. 
That's why this thing is a little bit complicated because you have two sets of weights. Support vector machine also has two sets of weights. Um, the weights on the features and then the weights on the examples. But in support vector machine, everything is so simple because it's quadratic regularization. You, I mean, everything is much simpler. Here it's not. OK, so intuitively what you want is the edges of the past hypothesis should be small after the update. Intuitively, you want to suck all the information that's in the weak hypothesis that you have so far and make them not have an edge anymore. So you put more weight on the hard examples towards the minus. So that decreases, decreases, decreases the weighted accuracy of the past hypothesis, i.e. their edge. Right? So you pull all the information out. And um, actually, the objective is you minimize the maximum edge. So it's, it's almost like maximizing the minimum margin, but the other way. Actually, it's going to be duality. So you minimize the maximum edge. Right? So the best hypotheses, good hypotheses have high edge. You want to, make, you want to pull all the information out, so you, you push down the maximum edge and minimize the maximum edge. That's the way it is. OK, now, this is the objective in the D domain. And then there's an objective in the other domain. There's uh, two domains, unfortunately. In the W domain, so here we have the margin interpretation. You choose a convex combination of weak hypotheses that maximize the minimum margin. Uh, I have a picture here. So here's your points. These are the negative points. Here are the positive points. Margin is here depicted as the distance. And then the minimum margin is the ones that are close. So those would be the red ones. And you want to maximize the minimum margin, i.e., find a hyperplane that keeps this apart as much as possible. Now, huh, this picture is wrong for boosting. It's the SVM picture. But that's the one that is understandable because we think geometric geometrically. I don't even know how to draw this thing for the one norm margins. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so this is the picture that explains the margin thing. And then the two are the same. And this is von Neumann's, that's 1920s, I think. Uh, min max edge is max min margin. OK? So that's kind of nifty. And um, that's why some people work over here, some people work over here. I usually work over here, and I add later on a regularization over here. Okay. So again, let me go back. These are important slides, so I have to be careful. Accuracy of a single example is this. When you go sum over all examples weighted by the distribution dn, you get the edge. So now t is fixed. When you sum out over the hypothesis, you have a weight per hypothesis, then you get the weighted accuracy of an example, and that's the margin. The philosophy is that you want to pull out all information from the best weak hypothesis. Their edges should be small. No more information them. Make their edge as small as possible. So you, maximize the, you minimize the maximum edge. And in the dual, you maximize the minimum margin. The two are the same. OK? Good. I'm not going to prove this, but I'm going to uh, give you visualizations of it. OK, so what I'm going to do now is go to game theory. Because this is min, max, max, min. That happens in game theory. You might have seen this. Zero sum games, classical game, rock, paper, scissor. Rock, paper, scissor, very ancient game. Um, Supposedly, they found it on some cave paintings. Uh, supposedly, this is the reason why humans learned how to count. I, I don't know whether that's true. Anyway, some anthropologists made some outrageous things. But uh, in the US, it's called Rochambeau because of some kind of French general that fought with, um, with Washington uh, at Yorktown against the British. I don't know why he was, his name was associated with this game. But it's a very, very simple game. 
uh, rock, paper, scissor, they play against each other and there's a payoff matrix. Uh, this is the row player, it's the minimizing player, the column player is the maximizing player and there's a trade-off matrix. You have seen this before. Okay, now rock, paper, scissor has all kinds of uh, um, implementations in biology, when you have speciation going on, very often what happens is there's three different morphs. Um, I have a friend that I teach evolutionary game theory classes with, um, Barry Sanervo, and he studies side blood lizard, lizards. Uh, there's three morphs, an orange type, a blue type, and a green type. The orange type is the macho type, beats up blue and, and but beats up blue, but doesn't recognize green. Green disguises as a female. Uh, blue gets beaten up by orange, but it recognizes green. And green gets beaten by blue, but sneaks into the territory of orange. So there's a rock, paper, scissor going on, and they study this. The male game is always very easy, because you see it on the outside. Um, the female game is more complicated, because some of it happens inside the body. There's sperm warfare, all kinds of interesting things. If you look up Barry Sanervo, he has all kinds of stuff. So what's happening here? Rock, paper, scissors, the three morphs of the lizards. Um, there's the payoff matrix. A strategy by nature would be at certain concentrations of different morphs. You put maybe 20% on this, 40% on this, um, uh, and then uh, whatever, the rest on this, and so forth, right? So these are the mixed, you have a mixture strategy. The rows are the pure strategies of the row player, the columns are the pure strategies of the column player. Once these probabilities are set, the payoff is this expected payoff, where you just, it's, it's a very concise form to write it. Um, it's um, the sum over all possible entries of the matrix weighted by the row weight and the column weight. Any questions? You have seen this before, right? These two guys play against each other. It's zero-sum game. Game theorists are not interested in this game because it's zero-sum. And zero-sum is not an interesting game to game theory, to game theorists, um, because um, they want to always have two payoff matrices. Here, whatever the guy, first guy gains, the other one loses, and that's sort of not the interesting case. In nature, there's many non-zero-sum games. Okay, so here's the optimum strategy for both. In this game, you play random. By the way, the best, if you want to play rock, paper, scissor, a, a computer will always beat you because it has randomness. Uh, and humans cannot do random, right? If you go into, uh, let me see, uh, it, you, you cannot do ter total randomness. And if you have any kind of smart online algorithm, uh, will always exploit your personal patterns and beat you. There's a little applet that was done in the binary case uh, by Freund and Shapira uh, that shows this, um, where you had to pre you predict coin flips against the computer, and the computer always beats you. OK. So um, this is the optimal setup. And uh, here's the Minimax theorem. Uh, first player picks a distribution. Second player responds, expected trade-off. That's the same as the uh, second player picking its distribution first. First player picks its distribution. These two are the same. The innermost, you can always make pure. This is over probability simplex. I didn't mention the probability simplex. It's implicit. The innermost happens always at the corner of the simplex. So the innermost can always be a pure strategy, a unit vector. This is the jth column. Here, the innermost is a row choice. So it's uh, the pure strategy of a row. Right? And then the value of this is the value of the game. OK, totally beautiful. So how does this relate to boosting? Well, your payoff matrix is that U matrix. Yes? Something happened? Well. No, 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 it doesn't work. I'm not doing it if it doesn't work. Ah. 
Yeah. Oops. What happened? Your machine somehow shut itself down. And then how do you make it full screen? It's the skin thing. Then something. Yeah. Apple P. Okay, um, so I explained, yeah, so the trade-off matrix sits in the middle. The rows are the examples. The columns encode the weak hypotheses. And the row sum is the margin of an example. The column sum is the edge of a weak hypothesis. And the value is the max, min max equals max min. So it, it totally fits. Okay, in general, in science, if you have some object that is used by many people, by many different disciplines, then it's usually a central concept. So in this case, look here. I gave you the optimum distribution. Now, how do I get an edge? I get an edge by doing something that corresponds to a column, which is a hypothesis. So this one. I take the, weighted al the weighting along here. It's a minus 1 times 0 0.3 plus 1, so the edge is 0. These edges are all 0. In this case, it's a little bit boring because all the edges are 0. Okay? And now, the minimum along the margins and the maximum along the edge is the value of the game, which is 0. Okay? Okay, so now what I do is, oh, I go ahead and I add a new column. Now it gets a little bit more interesting. So this was the maximizing player, the maximizing player. If I give him more choices by adding another column, that's going to help the maximizer, and the value of the game should go up. He still has the previous game, the rock, paper, scissor game, as a special case, this case. So he just helped the column, you just helped the column player. Indeed, if you do this, the optimum distribution is going to be this and this. Right? And now, let's say, look at that margin here. The margin would be summing along, the rows are the examples. The margin is summing along here. So I take 0 times 0.44, this times 0, and then I take 0.22 times minus 1, and then 0.33 times 1, and I get margin 1, 0.11. And you can check this is the other margins. See? Now I take the minimum of that. That is the value of the game. Now, I can also look at the edges. The edges are something per hypothesis. I have the weighting here. The weighting changed. Before it was a third, a third, a third. Now it's different. The optimum weighting. And I look at that thing. I sum, and I get 0.11 here. Now I take the maximum here, and even though I have a minus entry here, the maximum is 0.11, and it's th the value of the game is 0.11. The maximum, the minimum, is the same as the maximum. Cool? So it's really fun to figure this out. So here, I added one more column. Now I add one more row, just for fun. So now I help the minimizing row player. The row player is this guy. The row player is, is, is this guy that, that plays over here. He tries to minimize, push things down. If you give him more choices, he has the old game as a special case. I give him more choices, I help the row player, the value of the game should go down. Let's check that. Well. The optimum solutions in this case, which you have to solve it with linear programming, are these. Right? And, uh, and again, you look at the margins. You see here is a margin that is bigger than uh, the minimum. But the minimum margin is point minus 0.1, minus 0.11. The maximum is that. And the value of the game drops down.
questions at this point? So again, what I did is I defined the two objectives, edge and margin, right? And it corresponded to summing along a row and summing along a column, where the examples, the examples were the rows, the weak hypothesis were the columns, the weak hypothesis were the columns. And then I showed you how to, uh, here's the minimax theorem, d over simplex, w over simplex, the innermost can always be pure, right? Here I make the innermost poor and the outermost pure. See, those pure strategies, they're going to be, here they're the, the, the margins, now here, the, here they are the edges and here they are the margins. And the two are the same. And then I added columns, helping the rope, the, the column player, value of the game went up. Adding a row, that's sort of online learning where you add one example at a time. Uh, and that decreases the value of the game. So this matrix that sits in here is very, you can view it as very common to machine learning. And the only difference the classical one is you get one example at a time, which is another row, and the other one gets one row at a time. That's a, a, very, it's a very interesting thing. And of course, you could do interleave things, which we usually don't do for simplicity. So it's interesting that you can view it in one way, expanding this matrix in two different directions. One is boosting, the other one is online learning. Question? Okay. Huh. So what is boosting? Uh, there is this trade-off matrix in the center. I showed you one here. But imagine that there's an infinitely large trade-off matrix. You have gazillions of columns. Each column corresponds to a weak learner. They're not all in your hypothesis set yet. And as a matter of fact, you add them one at a time. The oracle provides you with a weak learner bam, the first weak learner, that makes your matrix to contain one column. Now there's gazillions of other ones all the way out here that could be continuously many that you haven't included yet. And you just add them one at a time. And the greedy scheme, the oracle always provides the next one to add. So, yes? Say that again? Uh, the weight, so what happens is, the learner, the booster, reweighs these examples as you go along. You see? You put the first, pretty initially have uniform distribution. Then you get the first weak learner. Then you reweigh things. Then uh, uh, you get the sec, you reweigh the examples again. And each time you reweigh the examples, and based on, based on these weights, the oracle then has to have certain guarantees. Usually, the simplest guarantee is you provide the one of maximum edge with respect to the current distribution. And it's pull, pushed back in, and then you keep on going. Do you, you understand? So this is sort of this interactive play. It's like online learning. The matrix here grows, but instead of it growing downward, it grows this way. Is that clear? You grow in the other direction. So this is what happens to the value of the game. Do you remember when we added columns, I said you help the column player. The column player is the maximizer. Value of the game goes up. Again, column player is the maximizer. You add columns, value of the game is up. So the value of the game goes up right? by adding more and more hypotheses that you select. So it's a greedy selection routine, and the value of the game goes up. Now, what is this line? This is the value if you added all infinitely many weak hypotheses. The whole game matrix, all weak learners are added. Uh, 
Um, so the goal, of course, is to get this to go up as fast as possible, as quickly as possible, with as few weak learners as possible, and efficiently. That's the goal of boosting. Yeah. Yes. So as you, as you know, intuitively, if you look at it game theoretically, what happens is if your payoff matrix is different, these D change. Yes. And I am the minimizer, so I'm going to pull the edges down. Because this is, I'm going to optimize it so the maximum minimum edge is optimized. So I'm going to find a solution that pushes the edges of the guys in there down. The oracle, on the other hand, when it comes in, if it's a good oracle, is going to give me one on high edge. So we play against each other. Something with high edge comes in, I push it down, suck out all the information. Another one of high edge comes in, suck out all the information. And as I do that, my whole value of the game goes up. So that's sort of the interactiveness of it. There's sort of two main oracles that people looked at. The one, the simplest one, is you turn the hypothesis of maximum edge. Right? So you return a hypothesis of maximum edge. So when you get when you when you are done with reweighing, you reweight here, you did your reweighing by pulling out all the information about on the existing hypothesis maximum minimum edge, then your oracle, if it wants to help you, the best way it can help you add one, or a very simple greedy scheme, is add one of maximum edge with respect to your current distribution. Okay, so that's called the strong oracle. There's other oracles where you, so for the strong oracles, the goal is for given epsilon, you want to get close to the value minus epsilon. So, I want to get within epsilon of the red line quickly. Okay, so that's the strong oracle setup. Now, there's another oracle called the weak oracle. So, the, you, all you know is that the edge is bigger than G, some guarantee. And in that case, the red line, in that case, G is this red line, and you want to get close to it. So for given epsilon, you want to produce a hypothesis of margin, or whatever the margin is, bigger than G minus epsilon. Okay. Uh, well, you can show that if your hypothesis, if your weak learner only gives you this guarantee, then in the worst case, you cannot get above G. So then your reasonable goal is this. This kind of, this is the oracle that you're probably going to remember. In practice, you might not have that oracle. You might have a weaker oracle. Uh, so it's sort of a, uh, the same thing happened in optimization theory, where the computate, this sort of corresponds to computing a gradient to find the maximum. I will show that next, next class, uh, no, tomorrow. Computing the maximum edge corresponds to a gradient calculation. And then you have things like a, an approximate gradient calculation. So people have done this kind of thing. But if you want to just memorize something, just the guy, the oracle is just returning to you the ones of maximum edge. OK, so here's the minimax theorem again. Now I want to explain in terms of linear programming duality. OK, <laughs> why is this the same? So I'm going to do it in pictures. Totally cool. So I can only draw this 
You see, I have distributions here. In D domain, I have a, a simplex. In W domain, I have a simplex. So two-dimensional simplex is characterized by one variable, D and one minus D. Two-dimensional simplex over here, one variable, W and one minus W. So I can plot for you the two-dimensional case. It becomes this plot. So this is the max min, and this is the min max. The other way around. Max, min max, max min. The blue is max min, min max. And they meet. And that's linear programming duality. They always meet. Uh, since I'm in a compact space, of the, I'm in the simplex, they will always meet. Uh, there's not the, the case where they don't exist doesn't happen. OK, so I did two examples, two hypotheses. A little bit boring. Um, I can visualize for you the other cases in some sense as well. So what I did here, what I'm plotting here is um, the blue is the maximum, do you see? Uh, min over maximum. So uh, each segment here corresponds to a hypothesis. So what I have here is two examples, d, which, on which I put d and 1 minus d. That's here. D, I call it d1 here for some reason. And then I have 1, 2, 3, 4 weak hypotheses. The minimum is the linear program, programming solution. OK. Now, um, it's a little bit of cheating, but I'm now doing I'm not showing you the corresponding one here because that would be boring, uh, but I show you the one on four examples and two hypotheses. Two hypotheses means you ha one has weight w and the other one one minus w, you see? And then the number of examples now corresponds to the linear segments here. And it's one of these curves and the two meet. Isn't that cool? There's a general proof. Uh, the, ha the first half of the proof is very simple. It's weak duality. The second half, you have to think. For linear programming, it's OK. It's not too hard. But Boyd, for instance, has this kind of stuff. Again, minimax is max main. Here it's visualized. The two polytopes meet, the blue and the red, at the value. Questions? Yes? So whether this map they meet is based on the properties of the cost matrix? Yes. Your update is when you're this situation, initially you have something, and then your update is to compute that D. Then you get the next guy in, and then you, you update your D. You get the next guy in, and you update your D. That's what your update is. You update your weights on the examples. And the boosting algorithms are going to do that. The simple ones, we're just going to do linear programming to do this ma minimax, optimize the max min. Fancy ones have regularization. You understand? So it's very simple. We do an iterative game. If you just solve the game by itself, if you don't regularize, if you don't do machine learning, you're going to be in trouble. You'll see that. But if you do a little bit of regularization, it will work. And you arrive at smart boosting algorithms. That's the overall scheme. Okay. The point is, the regularization that you need is entropic regularization, and everything gets messy. If you want to stick with Euclidean distance squared, then it's easy. But that's not, the perp not good here, because you work on simplices. For all of the mate game matrix that's in here now. Yes, and that intuitive is not going to work. And then we're going to get into the whole modern discussion of sparsity. Right. 
You will see all of that, all of the whole machine learning. You can, look, you can take support vector machines and unroll all of machine learning around it, right? Duality, capping, uh, uh, slack variables, and all of this. You can do boosting as well. If you do boost, use boosting, it's a more complicated story because things are not quadratic. So visualize that. OK. So here I can visualize the margin. Again, this is a little bit the wrong picture. I'm working on trying to visualize the one norm margin, but I don't have it yet. So it's the minimum margin. OK. Now, you can also, it's also instructive sometimes to go back and forth between the two settings, between the classical um, two norm regularization and the classical one norm regularization, which is boosting. Okay? So here we go. So um, I generalized the boosting setting a little bit. I did min max, but here this max, instead of uh, doing the simplex, I used the diamond. By the diamond, I mean that the sum of the di, the sum of the absolute values of the di is 1. If you, it's not a triangle, it's a diamond. So that's why I use that term. OK, it's the, L, the L1 ball. OK, good. So I can write it this way. Now I wrote it uh, um, in a slightly different way just for convenience. OK, I used the matrix, used this notation. It should be apparent what that means. If you let this go over the D, the diamond rather than the simplex, you get an absolute value on the left. That's the effect of that. And now, curiously enough, instead of writing over the diamond, I let the w over go over all of r, but divide by the one norm. So you can kind of see this is the same. You can see that this is a one norm margin. Boosting works with a one norm margin. Or this game theory thing, everything is one norm margin. Just because you work on simplices or diamonds. Okay. So, the simplex is sort of half a diamond, only positive. You can view this trick here of going from the simplex to the diamond as instead of getting one hypothesis, you always get h and minus h together. And then that corresponds to, you always get pairs. And that corresponds to working on the diamond. Okay. So it's, again, it's then the max of this and minus this, which is the absolute value. Very little intricate things. Now, in the, in the SVM case, all you would need to do, so it's not quite SVM because there's no regularization, but in that other world, you would work with the two norms. So I took the same max min, but instead of taking the one norm, pam, I put the two norm. You see? Two norm margin. Now, again, I can flip these, and I end up with that. Uh, and I can, since the inner, inside here is pure, and the inside is a, 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 over the simplex, I can make it pure, and voila, here I have the two norm margin. It's a dot product divided by the two norms. That's a two norm margin. That dot product divided by the one norm, it's a one norm margin. So it's the same mini max, maximin thing, but on the, on the left side here, I cannot make this pure, because this is not. Uh, over a simplex type thing. So this one cannot be made pure as up here, but when it's distribution over the examples, I can make it pure. So it's slightly more sophisticated over here. So that's sort of the corresponding thing that you can do for support vector machines. Questions? So I'm pretty much done with my first part. I'll start a little bit with the second part. I think it's a little bit more material. Um, if you have any questions to what I've done so far, let me know. Yes? No, they're not, they're, they have different number of pieces. 
in general, I mean, I could try to draw it in three dimensions, but three doesn't really help you. You would want to draw it in n dimensions, but we can't. We can only think in two dimensions, basically, humans. But if there's a polytope, this, the blue polytope is on top, and then the red polytope is on bottom, and the two meet. No, 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 not at all. Okay. Not at all. Uh, you see even, you see the number of pieces, the number of segments here corresponds to the number of weak learners. Yes. And the number of these guys corresponds to the number of examples. And if you can see, you can see here when I did this general setup, it is not that your matrix is square, right? For instance. So that's just an example that you happen to have an equal example Right. I, th the first plot I had was symmetric because the only plot I could do. It's oversimplified. OK, so how do I get, so this is the natural algorithm. A lot of people have guessed it already. LP boost. It just optimizes this with linear programming. So again, these are the, the dots, the dot products are these lines. And then the minimum maximum edge, the maximum of this is this, is a convex function. That was one of the properties of, uh, that Vichy said. So I'm only focusing now on this domain. The other half I don't need at this point. I only need it at the end when I output the hypotheses. So here's your little piece. And you can minimize this with linear programming because you can write this max. You introduce a variable alpha, and then you say all these have to be less than or equal to alpha, and you maximize alpha. I mean, it's, or whatever. There's a simple way to turn this into linear programming. Linear program. OK, now it turns out if you do this, as one person guessed or, or figured out already, oh, it works. OK. As one person figured out, uh, you put all the weights on examples with minimum margin on the crucial ones. Right? It's linear programming. Now, and that has major, major problems. I will show you pictorially in a moment. In simulations. So what you want to do is you want to add a regularization that spreads things out. And I cannot emphasize this more. So you add a relative entropy, and you still have the max objective. You just add this little regularization, you see, to, to your function. This function is very abrupt, has all these linear pieces. So what you do is you add a regularization. And that has an amazing effect. It, now the distribution on the example is not you put all the weight on the guys of um, uh, minimum margin. You do a soft min. It slowly decays, sort of exponentially. There's not that many concepts in machine learning, right? Uh, this is essentially what happens in logistic regression, that kind of soft min. It has an entropic motivation. It, again, if you look at logistic regression, the motivation of logistic regression is in terms of a relative entropy, if you do it in the right domain. And whenever you see this, it, this is associated with relative, relative entropy. Okay, so, and the value of this is a log partition function. We will see that in a moment. The derivative is this, is this thing. But it's e to the minus eta times the margin of the example. If eta goes to infinity, then this term disappears. Then this term disappears, no regularization, and you put all the weights on the, on the um, minimum margin. So you have the LP case as a special case when eta is infinity. So, and I'm going to show you now that this regularization is really necessary. And um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in machine learning around sparseness. Is sparseness good? People write all kinds of papers. Um, 
And I studied this stuff very carefully in this boosting context. And <laughs> uh, I have strong opinions now about it. In this context, sparsity didn't really work. In many, 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 very strong evidence. It's what we want. Yes, we want many things. But are you going to get learning and sparseness? That's tricky. OK, there's a little bit of overload. Yeah, this is soft min. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know what, uh, what another way is. There's an, later on, I'm going to use soft in a different way as well. It's a little bit over, overload of the word soft. OK, so again, if you do the hard thing, you put everybody on the, you do this thing here. It's very simple. People wanted to know what boosting does. Oh, yeah, well, the LP boost would just simply find a distribution that puts all its weight on the, on the, one with the, on the examples with minimum margin. The smarter way to do is the soft minimum margin. That's going to be entropy regularized LP boost. Okay, and uh, these other algorithms that I mentioned before, other boost, and there's going to be a whole family of them. I'm going to survey them. They do various approximations of this, but these are the two that are sort of at the core: LP boost nothing, and then entropy regularized LP boost. Okay, now I show you the effect of randomization, and then we have a break pretty much, yeah. So this is LP boost. I have to get out of this. I did. OK, here's the initial set initial hypothesis. And what happens is it focuses all its weight on the hard margin examples, which is going to be a very small number of examples. And uh, sparsity is totally screws you up here. Imagine you had huge number of examples. You would focus with your, hypoth with your weights on only very few examples. All the other weights would be 0. So. Any kind of feedback you get from the oracle can only be based on the examples that you put weight on. So you're only going to learn about those. So in principle, when you want to do online learning, in particular in an adversarial context, this is fundamentally not going to work. And I will prove it to you, actually. Because I was very obsessed with trying to get this right. And I finally found an example where there was, uh, these were exponentially worse than the other algorithms. Yes? Speak up. Yes. OK. Um, complicated questions. Kernels are usually designed for the two norm regularized problem. Um, I have cases where the, we. Vishy and I worked on this. Uh, we have cases where I give the multiplicative updates just n components to work with it. You know, a linear problem solves the problem and it takes log n, log, log n total loss or something like that. Then I let throw kernel based algorithm on it and I, we prove that even if I give you an arbitrary kernel, the loss of this other family of updates is order n. And, uh, but these are cases where the solution happens to be very sparse. In general, the two families are incomparable. But, uh, you know, there's these theorems out, the free lunch theorem. Uh, there's no free lunch. I hate that theorem because it doesn't capture what's going on, really. What happens is it is true that the algorithms are incomparable. But what happens is when the Multiplicative update is worse. It's not much worse than the additive update. And if it's the other way around, the additive update can be much worse than, exponentially worse than the multiplicative one. So uh, 
um, that's a different story. But here you can clearly see that focusing on the sparse things, it's just like it's not going to work. And if you look at the smoothened algorithm, which does a little bit of relative entropy, so that's the ERLB boost. Come on. Now there is a way to do it. View presentation. So this is much smoother. You can kind of see it's not as exaggerated. Everybody has still some distribution. And the learning rate will tell you how smooth it is. And it's a much more sane thing. It's much more of a machine learning thing. The, uh, the LP boost just runs around in, in random places and so forth. Now, the only case in which I can see um, one norm regularization be useful is in a case when you have batch data and a lot of randomness. So in some sense, the randomness becomes the regularization and it introduces some smooth, smoothing because of the randomness. If you don't have that, if you have any kind of worst case and if you have to learn online, sparsity will hurt you. That's my upshot. So let's do a five minute break. Oh, is there? And then I continue with this. Right? There's a break now? Yeah. Okay, 30 minute break. Okay.